Another incentive for the Americans to take more deliberate steps in developing their military was the increased tension with France in the mid to late 1790s. While America had been busy creating a government of, by, and for the people, France went through a revolution of its own. And as American relations with Britain improved, its relations with the now revolutionary France soured. Britain was again engaged in hostilities with France. The French were angered by America's apparent siding with Britain and attacked American merchant vessels. In 1798, Congress created the Navy Department and the U.S. Marine Corps to add to the nation's defense. The Army was increased to over 4,000 men and George Washington was coaxed out of retirement by President Adams to accept command as a lieutenant general. The prospect of America allying with Britain was enough to calm tensions and bring the parties to the negotiating table. War was averted, though not in time to save Adams from losing the 1800 election to Jefferson. Under Jefferson, much of the Navy was cut, and in 1802, the Army was reduced to a little over 3,200 men. As part of the 1802 reorganization, Congress created the Corps of Engineers. This was following decades-old advice from Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Henry Knox. They pointed to the Army's deficit in trained engineers and recommended the creation of a military academy soon after the end of the Revolutionary War. But Congress didn't take action for several years. Like a standing army, the idea of a military academy training officers in the manner of European warfare rankled many Americans. In 1794, the rank of cadet had been created for the artillery and engineering corps manning the fortifications at West Point, New York. But formal training of those cadets did not take place until 1801. By then, President Thomas Jefferson, though fiercely resistant to the idea of a strong national army, recognized the need to improve the science and engineering skills in both the military and the broader nation. The U.S. Military Academy at West Point was officially authorized on March 16, 1802, staffed by the 17-man Corps of Engineers. Jefferson soon took another, much larger action that would need the support of the Army the Louisiana Purchase. Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark led a 26-month military expedition that required the organization, ingenuity, and endurance that could be found in the U.S. Army. These soldiers would lead their men over 7,500 miles of rough country, providing the first detailed map of the area and bringing back valuable information. It was a major accomplishment, but another great challenge lay ahead. The France-Britain pendulum swung again. Britain and France were again at war, and America was insisting that it was a neutral party. But Britain imposed trade restrictions between America and France, which was both a hardship and an insult to American sovereignty. Furthermore, Britain had captured British-born Americans off of merchant sailing vessels and impressed them into service in the Royal Navy. Add to that Britain's continued support of the Indian tribes in the Northwest Territory, providing arms to Indians who then raided American settlements, and finally, in 1812, America could take no more. On June 1, 1812, President James Madison asked Congress for a declaration of war and received it. The regular army was increased to an authorized strength of almost 37,000 men. Volunteer regiments and state militia would also have a role in this war and eventually 20 additional infantry regiments would be added to the regular army with one year enlistments. Infantry regiments were recruited from individual states so that most of the men in a regiment all came from the same state. 
Congress offered signing bonuses of land and cash to bring in the men. In the war, America fought the British at land and sea, and they also fought the British allies, the Indians of the Northwest Territory, who were led by the Shawnee war leader, Tecumseh. Tecumseh had already been giving the American military trouble before this war began. And in August 1812, his men helped the British capture Detroit. But the city was recaptured a year later by Navy Captain Oliver Hazard Perry. And Tecumseh himself was killed at the Battle of the Thames. With his death, the alliance of Indian tribes fell apart. The greatest battle of the War of 1812 actually took place after the Treaty of Ghent had been signed, ending the war. On January 8, 1815, Major General Andrew Jackson, unaware of the treaty signed weeks earlier, led an amalgamated force of about a thousand regulars and three to four thousand militia, including pirates and freed slaves, much to the consternation of many, to defend the city of New Orleans against a force almost three times his size. Years later, Teddy Roosevelt would write of Jackson's success against a superior foe. Praise is due to the American soldiers, for it must not be forgotten that they were raw troops opposed to veterans. And indeed, nothing but Jackson's tireless care in drilling them could have brought them into shape at all. In the open field, the British regulars, owing to their greater skill in maneuvering and to their having bayonets, with which the Tennesseans were unprovided, could in all likelihood have beaten them. But in rough or broken ground, the skill of the Tennesseans, both as marksmen and woodsmen, would probably have given them the advantage. The American soldiers deserve great credit for doing so well. But greater credit still belongs to Andrew Jackson, who, for his cool head and quick eye, his stout heart and strong hand, stands out in history as the ablest general the United States produced, from the outbreak of the revolution down to the beginning of the Great Rebellion. It wasn't long before Andrew Jackson was leading troops to war again, this time in the Seminole Wars in Florida. The Seminoles were a Native American nation of tribes and included men who were escaped African-American slaves. This wasn't Jackson's first conflict with Indian tribes of the South. Before his great victory at New Orleans, Andrew Jackson had defeated the Creek Nation in Alabama and Georgia, forcing the tribes to cede vast portions of their land to U.S. government. Indian wars continued while America, as always, looked west. If you're eager to see more of our historical documentaries, please like, share, and subscribe.